system uh, which is the uh, fourth of you know seven series session the first second third was based on uh, know your feco machine wound construction and rexis and hydro procedures today we have come to what is called the uh, nucleus management at the onset i would like to thank the whole team of uh, johnson and johnson especially mr suhas with whom i have had a long association of about 5 years and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to moderate a session on feco emulsification well uh, our speaker today needs no introduction that is for sure and in fact to describe him uh, in just one slide would be doing a big injustice to a person of his stature a journey of such a great person cannot be described in such a few points he is a legend he is a icon he is a inspiration and an achiever he is none other than our own kalaiva or kala of ophthalmology dr mohan rajan dr mohan rajan is a perfect all rounder in ophthalmology according to me i'll tell you why he has achieved great heights in ophthalmology he established his own center rajan eye center in uh, chennai tnagar long ago he is the top most one of the top most uh, feco surgeons in india performing uh, you know feco with uh, premium iols he is a pan ophthalmologist which is a rare breed even today so he is an inspiration to us uh, he is competing with the most young ophthalmologist in fact he has won 55 opls that's why we call him the kala of course and uh, which is a world record he has great achievement in uh, academics too he has 25 named orations 42 publications i think it's increasing day after day so by the time i tell 42 it will be 44 also and several uh, video record uh, awards in uh, national and international platforms he is the author of many books for your eyes only contact lens practice learning feco the easy way so many books his achievement in the field of community ophthalmology which is rare for a you know is also commendable his uh, chennai vision charitable trust has done more than uh, i think uh, 2100 free eye camps more than a lakh surgery i mean which is great uh, 3 lakh plus school students have been screened his personal life is also very balanced uh, dr sujatha his wife is assisting him in his practice he has two daughters waiting to take over the reins as well he himself is a sportsman a cricket captain i heard of uh, madras medical college am i right sir yes sir yes yeah. madam yes he is a, he is a great golfer too that's what i have heard and uh, i can go on and on and in fact we need one more session to describe his achievements so without delay i would like to hand over the reins to dr mohan rajan to start today's class thank you sir Shall I share my screen with him? Yes, yes. Yeah, able to see my screen? Yes, yes, sir. First of all, uh, let me thank Madam for the wonderful introduction. Certain things that even I didn't know in my uh, CV. Yes, uh, told, but uh, let me thank again for this wonderful introduction, and also thank uh, J and J for the wonderful opportunity they have been giving not only uh, me but also the uh, it's actually a learning platform for all of us here. and many of the uh, i got lot of feedback from all the post graduates residents and practicing ophthalmologists about the past three webinars and today i'm going to talk about the nucleus management these are my financial interests <clears throat> the first webinar was on know your feco mission the second one was on wound construction the third one that is last week i did on capsular rexes and hydro procedures and all these three th these three things are very important for us before we handle the nucleus and that is why we have got the uh, today's class as nucleus management 
as you know nucleus management is, is very very important but it is not as important as the first three ones the first three topics are very very important you need to know your phaco mission much better than your spouse <clears throat> then of course womb construction many of us take it for granted i have emphasized the importance of womb construction during my webinar on the uh, about two weeks back and of course capsular excess and hydro procedures knows how important it is <clears throat> now the nucleus normally it's about 6 to 8 mm depending on the density of the cataract this nucleus has to come out through a small incision of about 2.8 or 1.8 or 2.2 whatever whether you're using an mics or regular phaco it has to come through the phaco tip into the <coughs> aspiration line the nucleus has to be cut and taken so depending on the softness of the nucleus the grade of the cataract i have divided this nucleus management to different all the same technique for soft tracks <clears throat> the counter or the four quadrant technique for moderate cataracts for little harder cataracts then you can go for stop and chop then of course the super chop so i'll be discussing this nucleus management mainly on these topics now look at this very soft cataract what i do for a normal soft cataract i make a rexis which is slightly bigger bigger in the sense that instead of 5 mm i make it slightly about 5.5 mm so once i do a you can see that i have made a rexis there the once i do a <coughs> hydro delineation or hydro dissection normally i don't do hydro delineation but you can see the once i do that the whole so called nucleus soft one comes into the anterior chamber this is a relatively young patient and the whole thing is just aspirated using a phaco hand piece or you can even use a ie hand piece but takes a little more time and then you can go ahead with the cortical removal as well this is spring surgery a little more hard cat right you can do spring surgery wherein you can have a shallow trench here by using very low phaco power because these are all very soft cataracts and then once you make a shallow trench there and a wider trench you can make a 6 o'clock nucleotomy you can see that and then rotate the nucleus and then flip it up this is what we call as chip and flip which has been already originally described by paul cock <clears throat> and you can use a little more aspiration flow rate little more vacuum the whole thing just starts the whole nucleus just starts folding into the anterior chamber or the iris plane and without using much phaco energy the whole thing can be aspirated or using in the hyper pulse which is a regular feature of all the phaco machines nowadays the whole thing can be aspirated and go and and we can uh, uh, take care of the nucleus as well now this is the problem this is the challenge <clears throat> these are cataracts which are neither soft nor they are hard these are called the nhnt cataracts nhnt means neither here nor there this is always a challenge because, because this cataracts we are never able to hold it you can see that not able to hold it very difficult to chop very difficult to crack <clears throat> very good, difficult to suck also i call this in between cataracts or nhnt cataracts what i do is normally i make a very very shallow I'm sorry narrow trench going all the way down and then try to divide the cataract into two pieces two halves and then go ahead and use a little more aspiration flow rate and vacuum and the whole cataract will start I and mean, sometimes you can even chop the once you divide the cataract but division of these cataracts is a little i just wanted to show you because it's always a challenge is in between cataracts or the nhnt neither here nor there is always a challenge now the four core <laughs> cracking <coughs> the divide and conquer which has been described by dr gimbel sculpting and trench digging making four trenches which is about 90 degrees apart nucleus cracking going all the way down 
emulsification of the nucleus in the bag. And the problems encountered by beginners is that there can be insufficient trench digging, aggressive cracking, and aggressive cracking can open up the posterior capsule as well or produce stress on the zonules. Improper separation, which means that the, the lens fibers can be still be attached and the whole nucleus can start coming into the anterior chamber and you can have a white cornea the next day. So this is the divide and conquer. You can see here what I'm trying to do is I'm making a deep trench there and then going ahead and making another trench there. So this is called the four quadrant technique or the divide and conquer technique. It's like a Maltese cross there. So what you do is for the trenching, you use low FACO power, high FACO power and low vacuum, low aspiration flow rate. You don't want holdability of the cataract. You just want cutting of the cataract for trenching. You can see the four crosses are there and then we can go to the two second instruments, go to the base of the <coughs> trench and try to do a lateral separation. Same time, a posterior movement also is there and so that you can have the four quarters and then you can use the aspiration flow rate, increase aspiration flow rate so that the increase the followability of the uh, nu nucleus, increase vacuum so that the holdability of the nucleus can also be there and reduce the FACO power. You can see here this is a FACO 1 parameters, moderate to high FACO power, low vacuum and uh, I'm using a Venturi system so the aspiration flow rate doesn't come into the picture. So, crosses. The problem again is to know exactly when to crack because you need to know all the way go down, especially with grade 2, grade 3 cataracts or grade 4 cataracts, you have to go 90% of the depth of the nucleus till you see a uniform red glow in the base of the trench there. And then you can go ahead and separate. Either you use two second instruments, you can see here, don't make sure that you don't give too much of lateral separation or too much of lateral force there. And again, once you crack the nucleus into four halves, then you can go ahead and increase the vacuum and lower the FACO power. So I made sure that you can see here, once you crack the posterior leathery attachments, which are there in the harder cataracts, this is only a grade two cataract, so it comes off very easily, but making sure that the, all the FACO emulsification is done right in the center of the pupil so that it doesn't damage the posterior capsule or doesn't damage the, uh, uh, the corneal endothelium as well. Then we go on to a little um, um, uh, harder cataract. This is a stop and chop. Again, you can see the FACO 1 parameters. High FACO power, low vacuum, FACO 2. Instead of the four crosses, I just make the one single trench and try to divide the cataract into two halves and then go in and go in and use a very high vacuum and an aspiration flow rate if you're using a peristaltic system and then going ahead and chopping each of these halves by using the chopper and the left hand and which is again very very important to use the left hand you have to be ambidextrous. Just to show you the down slope sculpting and uh, producing a deep central crater Again, you can see here how I'm trying to do that. I'm going all the way down in a, in a, in a slightly supra hard cataract. The stop and chop, you need to go almost 90 to 95% of the depth before you try to crack the cataract into two halves, making sure that you see the posterior capsule through and through, making sure that the crack is completely extending from one side to the other and then going ahead and chopping. The chopping is done right in the front of the nexus margin, something like an anterior chop or the vertical chop, <coughs> which we'll talk about during the right chop technique. Again, you can see here how it is very dense cataract, grade four, grade five. Normally I don't do the stop and chop just for demonstration, I'm showing you that, and how the uh, uh, four quadrant technique, the uh, uh, is done, you can see here the FICO 1 parameters, the FACO 2 parameters, the FACO 1 parameters in a peristaltic mission is about 60 and the power, that the power vacuum is about 50. You don't want much vacuum at that time because you don't want holdability, you don't want the nucleus, you uh, hold the nucleus. Aspiration flow rate is only 20 ml per minute 
And once you go into the FACO2 after the division of the nucleus into four quarters, or the four quadrants, I would say, then you go in for the FACO2 parameters, when the FACO power becomes less, you can go for the hyperpulse or the regular pulse, which is available in all the machines now, with a vacuum of about 350, 400 millimeters, you can use depending on whatever machine you're using, and an AFR of about 35 or 40, again, whatever you're comfortable. The stop, chop, chop and stuff used for brown cataracts, nucleus divided into two halves, as I told you. Each half is then chopped in front of the capsular excess margin using high vacuum FACO power. This is how the stop and chop technique, which I showed you, going all the way down <coughs> and making a crack, which extends from one end to the other, making sure that you see the posterior capsule through and through. There should not be any residual fibers which are getting attached there. The surgical technique is, of course, temporal clear corneal, capsulorexis, 5 to 5.5, cortical cleaving hydrodissection, which we had talked about last week, and good nucleus rotation before you do the chopping or the cracking of, of these things. Always make sure that you do a good hydro procedure and to stop and chop. You can see the FACO settings. Power is moderately high. Initially, always use more FACO power. If you try to use less FACO power and do the trenching, every time, every time you do the trenching, you'll be pushing the nucleus. And every time you push the nucleus, that will be stress on the zonules and the posterior capsule. The flow rate is moderately low, about 14, 20 cc per minute. Vacuum is also low, <coughs> 10 to 30 millimeters of uh, mercury because you don't want holdability at the time of trenching. Width of the FACO tip, Width of the, uh, the, the, the trench is about 1 to 1.5 FACO tips. Depth is about 3 to 3.5. As I told you, the depth increases or directly proportional to the density of the cataract. Grade 3, you can go up to about 80%. Grade 4, grade 5, you need to go about 90-95% before you divide the cataract. So these are the FACO 1 parameters. The power of about 70. The vacuum of about 50. And the AFR about 25. And the FACO2, once I chop the cataract into, uh, divide the cataract and then chop it into multiple pieces, then my FACO power comes down, the vacuum increases, the AFR increases. As I told you in the first class, the AFR is directly proportional to the fallibility of the nucleus. If you want the nucleus to come forward into the tip much faster, in the peristaltic machine, you can adjust the AFR, increase the AFR as well. <clears throat> so instruments can be either crossed or uncrossed, two instrument technique or instruments, or you can use the FACO tip and the second instrument technique, uh, second instrument, or you can come out and fill up the uh, globe uh, anti chamber with viscoelastic and go all the way down to the bottom of the trench and you can have the two instruments on both sides or crossed or uncrossed and check for completeness of the crack. That is the most important, whether you use the two instruments or use the FACO tip. The completeness of the crack is very, very important for you to understand this ball game. Chopping technique, the FACO tip is embedded in the nucleus and always look for the vacuum, that is the pre vacuum going to the preset vacuum. In a peristaltic machine, you'll hear the sound, the sound wherein the vacuum has gone to the preset vacuum. Suppose if we have a preset vacuum of about 350 or 400 millimeters, as soon as it reaches 400 millimeters on the occlusion of the tip, that is the time when you have to go in and chop and engage any fragment is in the, also in the, safe, in the safe zone. Chopping is done from the center to the periphery with the lateral separation from the FICO tip as I showed earlier. Vertical chopping, chop in situ, We'll talk about it anterior to the rexis margin. The FACO probe holds the nucleus. The chopper is depressed posteriorly to separate the nucleus. Lateral separation of the nuclear fragments is very important. Nucleus piece is chopped into smaller fragments, as smaller as possible, so that you don't have to use much FACO energy to aspirate or emulsify these pieces. As I told you, the FACO power settings are very, very important for you to understand this very important. Two fragments are just chopped. You can see here how I'm chopping this, each of these halves into multiple pieces here. 
so that it makes it easier for the FACO tip to aspirate this because these are all hard cataracts sometimes. Because you can so stop and chop, you can go in for the hard cataracts, super hard cataracts like this, like a piece of granite you can see here. And these are cataracts wherein we divide and conquer, it takes a longer time, longer surgical time, longer, uh, more uh, heat is also delivered into the anterior chamber because a lot of FACO energy is also used. Stop and chop can be used, can be done, but that also takes because a long time because you need to go all the way, as I told you, all the way down to the bottom of the trench, which is going to be, these are all very thick cataracts of about 5 to 6 millimeter thickness, and 8 to 10 millimeters of the diameter as of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the of nucleus as well. So these are cataracts which have got nucleus and more nucleus. There is no cortical cushion. And the nucleus doesn't have epinucleus also. It's very difficult to do hydro delineation. I always do hydro dissection only in these cases. <clears throat> As you know, this hard brown cataracts, common scenario in India. 60% of the cataracts are grade 3 and above. The pupil is small and posterior capsule is weak. This you have to take him now, keep in account uh, in the back of your mind, especially when you are dealing with heart cataracts. This is always a challenge to the FACO surgeons. Difficult to crack the nucleus because of the leathery posterior nuclear plate, thin posterior capsule, large nucleus, poor or no cortical cushion, increased incidence of the corneal edema and post-operative corneal decomposition, increased incidence of PCR nucleus drop and all these are problems can occur. So the excessive FACO energy, the difficult to perform in the back FACO, difficult in cracking due to leathery fibers, no cortical cushion, stress on the PC and zoomules, irreparable endothelial damage to the hard lens fragments which are going rapidly in the anterior chamber as well. We use excess FACO energy, especially in the incision is a little tight. In these supra-hard cataracts, you can end up in a corneal burn like this. And you know the con consequences of a corneal burn can produce wound gaping, infection, inflammation, even endophthalmitis and irregular astigmatism as well. And sometimes you can have corneal edema. The cornea can be white. It will take a long time, about one or two months for the corneal edema to clear up. <clears throat> sometimes you can have a dismissed detachment. And all these problems can occur because of the excess equation which are there in the scene. You can have something like a fibrin reaction or something like a TAS, toxic anterior segment signal syndrome in these patients with uh, 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 you have corneal edema as well. And these are the problems which can occur with techniques you see. What I have suggested is for techniques for heart cataract, either a stop and chop, supracapsular phaco, which we can talk later. Of course, the straight chop or the karate chop or the vertical chop is the what I am using. Before you know exactly how to chop, you know the how the hyperpulse works, the hyperpulse or the micropulse, which is available now in all the missions. Of course, the <coughs> Alcon missions have got what is possible and the ellipse, which is there also in the Signature Pro. But more importantly, the hyperpulse, the white star, the J and J or the AMO were the ones who started this, the hyperpulse, wherein comes, wherein the on time can be reduced to as less as three to four milliseconds. The off time can be about uh, since the duty cycle is on plus off time divided by the on time. You can see during the on time, it cuts the cataract during the off time, it cools the tip and sets the cataract as well and prevents the chatter. If you use a continuous FACO power, of course, a lot of heat is delivered in the anterior chamber. You can have a white cornea. You can see the hyperpulse mode, how it actually gobbles up the nucleus, despite the fact there's a fairly dense cataract as well. So it doesn't allow the chatter. You can see the chatter if you use a continuous FACO power <coughs> or the FACO energy. The nucleus comes and hits the tip and goes away. And every time it hits the tip and goes away, there's a lot of FACO energy which is used. And the tip can go and touch the endothelium. And that is the reason for the corneal edema postoperatively. The evolution of the chop techniques, the chop, the stop and chop by Paul Cock, we have already seen that. The stop, chop and chop and stuff, which is described by Abhay Vasubhata. And step by chop, again by Dr. Vasubhata for all these heart cataracts. The disadvantages, 
or the conventional chopping and the horizontal chopping which we'll talk about is that you need to place and chop an under anterior capsule and come from the periphery to the center the problem is this uh, can produce a zone dialysis and sometimes even a pc rupture especially when you have no cortical cushion stuffing the cataracts which means that in chopping the vertical chopping or the direct chopping whether you use horizontal or vertical chopping your left hand actually works if your right hand surgeon the left hand actually works much more than the right hand you need to be ambidextrous you need to make sure that the left hand works much more and chop and chop that is spread this uh, nucleus into smaller pieces and try to stuff it inside so that more and more pieces the chopped fragments further divided small pieces stuffed into the port minimal no phaco energy is used phaco aspiration is actually a phaco aspiration <coughs> with a combined with the cold phaco technology with the hyperpulse or the micropulse and apasomy machine has got something like an occlusion micropulse wherein the occlusion of the tip automatically the micropulse will start getting activated and of course we have the infinity or the centurion it's got the ip the intrigen phaco software wherein 90% of the occlusion of the tip again there is a, a what you call along with the ozil there is a what you call something like a pulse a longitudinal phaco pulses which make sure there is a fallibility increases with these types of cataracts so vital steps is complete splitting of leathery fibers that is the posterior nuclear plate is very important and phaco aspiration is most used that is which is high vacuum and high aspiration flow rate reduce the risk to the pc and zone use useful in small pupils as well this is just to show you how you use the tangential chop and the tangential chop is wherein we make a slightly larger rexus 5.5 mm and try to do a hydro and this can be used about in about grade 2 cataracts and high myopia wherein the entry chamber is deep wherein the whole nucleus starts coming into the iris plane or entry chamber and it chop from the periphery to the center again if you notice that my left hand works much more than the right hand and i use more of a phaco aspiration and this works <clears throat> the tangential chop works very well in patients who have got high myopia like this and also relatively less dense cataract of course with hard brown cataracts you can't do that otherwise you'll have a white cornea the next day you can see here once they uh, till the, the, the nucleus starts saluting after the hydro dissection and i just uh, what do you call uh, uh, chop the cataract from the periphery to the center and and the whole nucleus disappears within within a fraction of a, a second and you can see here this horizontal chop i use a blunt chopper i don't use a sharp chopper i go underneath the rexus and then coming from the periphery you can see that once i have done a hydro delineation there is a cortical cushion in this it's a grade 2 cataract grade 2 with grade 3 cataract and you can see here how i am going and i'm i'm creating a vacuum seal there and going underneath the rexus and coming from the periphery this is a horizontal chop wherein you are seeing again the same parameters are used like the vertical chop as well as i told you whenever you want to uh, what do you call thing you just have to have the use of burst phaco or a continuous phaco and try to create a vacuum seal there and once you chop the cataract into smaller pieces increase the aspiration flow rate and that's why the horizontal chop works in very brown cataracts i combine the technology the like stellar is also a signature pro with technique vertical chop or the sharp chopper the sharp chopper is uh, uh, what i have devised mohan rajan chopper any chopper can be used the only thing is it has to be long and sharp <clears throat> in a horizontal chop you can use you have to use a blunt chopper whereas in vertical chop especially for brown cataracts very black cataracts you have to chop through and through you need to have a longer chopper i have the chopper in different sizes 1.75 1.5 and 2 mm normally for brown cataracts i use about 1.75 for cataract of niagara too i use about 2 mm which is uh, uh, which is actually very scary to see under the microscope if you want to stab somebody in the abdomen you can use a 2 mm chopper as well absolutely because these cataracts are very very hard cataracts very sharp tip and you can see how it works this is a 1.5 1.75 mm and there is a 2 mm chopper you can see here how it is there it's long and sharp 
with a very sharp tip as well. And you can see here, this is a Stellaris PC, which is a Venturi system. I'm using, you can see the parameters, the FACO power of 50%, vacuum of about 450 to 600 millimeters, which is on the dual linear. I'm using the uh, uh, different types of chopper here. You can see I'm using the 1.75 millimeter chopper. I'm just going down, bevel down, can go bevel down, bevel up, bevel sideways. Only thing is you need to be vertically down in this uh, chopping techniques. In the vertical chop technique or what we call as karate chop or anterior chop. This is a duty cycle. You can see 40%, which as I told you, the duty cycle is the on plus off time divided by the on time. The pulse is about 90 pulses. You can go up till 240 pulses in Signature Pro, which is actually the gold standard as well as the White Star, that is the Hyper Pulse is concerned, they were the first ones to introduce way back in 2003 or 4 at that time when the Hyper Pulse came into the cold FICO, came into the, uh, what do you call, into practice. You can see here, the, I'm chopping the cataract, I'm using my left hand more, much more than the right hand. You can see different types. Again, the stellar is mixed surgery. The first chop you can see is very important. Going all the way down, these are the parameters I use. You can see the parameters on top. I can see here every time I uh, am using 1.8 millimeter incision and every time I make sure that the chop is in, going all the way through the advantage of using a chopper, like a sharp chopper, like Mohan Rajan chopper, which is made by Apasami, I don't have any financial interest, is that it opens up the posterior nuclear plate without any problem. And you can see here, once you open up, you can see here, one, you create a vacuum seal, you keep the chopper right in front there, in front of the FACO tip and and the chopper works really like magic. Once you chop the cataract into smaller pieces, then you need to go to a higher vacuum and a higher aspiration flow rate if you're using a peristaltic machine. And automatically being a Venturi system, this, uh, this thing goes up and the advantage of Signature Pro, they can, you can switch from the Venturi to the peristaltic and the peristaltic to the Venturi. And it's called the dual pump by just changing the switch. You can see that and this is a little, little more harder cataract I'm using the Stellaris mix uh, 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 this thing for this. And you can see here how I just created a very small trench there. These are the parameters I use. I'm going to chop. The chopping is done right in front of the rexis margin. I always stain this uh, rexis with trip and glue in these patients because I want to know where exactly my rexis is. And uh, even if it's not a white cataract, the brown cataracts also. I know exactly where my excess margin is so that I don't sing. And it's not like the horizontal chopping, where you can't do horizontal chopping for this. And it's very difficult because this can see here, the nucleus is more nucleus, absolutely no cortical cushion. It's very actually dangerous to do an horizontal chopping because you go and damage the zonules. And it's a, it's a little blind technique. If you have cortical cushion, then horizontal chopping, as I showed earlier. And this is a quick chop express. Little brown cataracts, supra hard cataracts, I developed this technique called Quick Chop Express, where everything occurs very, very rapidly. And you have to use a Venturi system, but nowadays all the peristaltic systems also mimic Venturi systems. All the mim mim uh, <coughs> Venturi system we mimic the peristaltic system as well. I go bevel down as if we are going into the anterior vitreous, and then I go bevel down and vertically down. And you can see here, the chopping is then right in front of the excess margin. You can see here, I'm just creating a vacuum seal by uh, just creating a small burst of FACO there, a FACO power, and just holding the nucleus. As I'm holding the nucleus, I'm making sure that the right side of the, the, the wherever I'm holding with the nucleus, I'm holding it even for, um, uh, tighter there, so that while I'm chopping, I'm making sure that the posterior nuclear plate, these are the parameters I use, about 50 to 60% in power, 450 to 600 on the dual linear, on the stellar system, duty cycle of about 40%, pulse of about 90 pulses per second. As I told you, the pulses per second, you can go up till 120 in, in a stellar system, you can go up till 240 in a signature pro system. So it doesn't matter, but here, higher the pulses, it's better actually. I create, you can even more uh, harder cataracts, like grade six cataracts can see here and create a small trench and just to show you how important it is to open up the posterior nuclear plate going all the way step by step chop in situ and lateral separation which has been described by Abhay Vaswada he's a man who's actually 
uh, taught us all. You can see here, right in front of the Rex's margin, I'm chopping all the way. And I'm using the sharp chopper, the um, uh, Rajan chopper here, 1.75 millimeter. And you can see here, every time I go there and I'm doing the thing, I know exactly where my capsular Rex is. I make the Rex is slightly bigger because I know this cataracts are very, very big. I know exactly where my Rex's margin, I make a Rex's about 5.5 millimeter and not about 5 millimeter, uh, which is normally I make about 5 or 5.1 millimeter, normally other cataracts, but little brown, brown cataracts, super hard cataracts, I make it little easy. So once you do that, you can see that I'm uh, uh, aspirating this cataract, you should just have to stay in the center. Once you divide the cataract into smaller pieces, you can go on the dual linear, you can go on the Venturi in the Signature Pro, Whatever machine you are comfortable, all the machines are working very well today. All the machines are uh, uh, with the fantastic software, fantastic fluidics. The ch chamber stability is very, very important. Only thing is you have to be very competent on a foot switch. And you can see here the whole thing comes. Now and then we inject viscote into the anterior chamber, which is very, very important. Again, you can see here this is a black cataract, cataract Niagara. <clears throat> These are the parameters I use. I create a little... Uh, 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 bigger trench for back cataracts. You can see here how the separation of the cortical, I'm sorry, the nucleus fibers is very, very important. Again, chopping, going and uh, uh, burying the tip into the FICO. Making sure that the tip of the, the tip gets exposed very nicely. Much better exposure of the tip is very, very important. And then step by step chop, going all the way down using the sharp chopper and making sure that you see the posterior capsule through and through, which means that the leathery fibers have to be opened up very nicely. Before that, you can see that, how I'm, uh, see the, uh, the, the posterior nuclear plate is opened up very nicely. I'm able to see the posterior capsule through and through. And then once you do that only, you can you have to bring it up into the iris plane or into the center of the pupil and aspirate this cataract or emulsify this nucleus pieces into it. Making sure that you do that into smaller pieces as well. As I told you, this coat, I don't have any financial interest. Again, this coat you need to put now and then into the anterior chamber so the corneal endothelium is well protected. Again, I'm using an Alcon Infinity, uh, uh, which I used to be before I used the Centurion. Nowadays, I'm using the Centurion and the Signature Pro more commonly. And you can see here how the, it's a very mature cataract, brown, uh, brown cataract as well. You can see here, how the chopping is going all the way down. Just to demonstrate to you, the chopping is just right in front. Keep the chopper right. Don't trip the chopper this way and that way. Make sure the chopper is directed directly towards the optic nerve. And you can see here how the chopping, the vertical chopping becomes very easy. Once you chop the cataract into smaller pieces, then it's a child's play for all of us. These are the parameters I use on Alcon Infinity, which is also similar to the Centurion machine, whatever I'm using. Again, the next step is the catalyst laser, which I'm using for now all brown cataracts nowadays, just to show you how the catalyst makes the life easy. If you have access to the Femco cataract, I'm sure uh, many or many centers are having in India, in, in our country now, and all over the world also, just to show you how this cataract, you can, you can divide this division has come out in, uh, in uh, six uh, 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 six tons and it's fairly great to cataract how the cataract, the entire cataract gets aspirated because already the pre chop is already being done by the catalyst laser, the femto laser, <clears throat> and makes life very, very easy. I'm taking this level to a different level now, a, a, a different level of cataract. You can see a little harder cataract about grade three, grade four, and I can see here how the the chopping is already done by the, the thing. The very fact that the gas bubbles are getting released, it means that the chopping has gone all the way to the posterior nuclear plate. What you have to do is just bury the tip and then keep the chopper there and separate. You can even use a Sinsky hoop because already it's separated there and makes life very, very easy when you use a catalyst laser for this hard cataracts. So just to show you this Femto cataract again, again, this is a very brown cataract, grade five, grade six. And uh, as you can see here, I'm just making a very, very small trench there. And then whatever machine you're using, you can see here how the gas bubbles are getting released from the posterior nuclear plate. And you can see that cleavage planes are already there. I usually make eight quadrants or octants in these uh, types of cataracts. And just to show you 
how the nucleus can be managed very effectively despite the density of the cataract how it can be managed if you have access to the uh, uh, to the catalyst laser or the lens x or the bosch and long victus or whatever your uh, this thing is there but it makes life easy because the amount of phaco energy is used is very less because already the, the pre chop is being done you can see that the pre chop is being done and then you can do that again making sure that you introduce viscoat into the anterior chamber very important just to mention about supra capsular phaco what is the supra capsular phaco the supra capsular phaco was introduced by william meloni <coughs> the exclusion criteria are poorly dilating tubules sick cornea black cataracts and uh, these are done for the for the supra hard cataracts and uh, uh, the brown cataract surgical technique is capsular excess aim for about 6 mm nowadays we can't afford to have a 6 mm excess unless you are using doing something like a crystal lens hydro dissection is 24 uh, kg cannula and so lens starts saluting so once the lens salutes in the what happens is you can invert the nucleus is based on the anterior capsule in the posterior chamber william meloni uh, believed that we also also believe i used to do lot of supra capsule long time back but nowadays i am not doing this technique because it involves a lot of manipulation just to for the completion sake i am telling you the larger ccc the hydro dissection results in the spontaneous lens tilt the lens can be inverted and put from that is the prudence placed on the anterior capsule in the ulta fashion that is the posterior nuclear plate is facing you and the anterior part of the lens is actually facing the posterior capsule so it is inverted and put on the anterior capsule and then they go ahead and they do, uh, do the phaco emulsification and uh, visco inverted nucleus final reposition in the posterior chamber on the not in the capsular bag but on the anterior capsule uh, and the posterior capsule and then go what happens is because you are because you are dealing with the harder fibers which are the posterior nuclear plate first it makes life easy you can open up the posterior nuclear plate much more easier than the other way around that is the ma- basic principle of this william meloni's supra capsular phaco the problem is the manipulation these are some of the results of the supra capsular phaco easier to chop the nucleus from behind than from the front higher afr you can use enhanced pulling power and carrying capacity nucleus is mobilized and evacuated more efficiently with far less chance of capsular rupture no damage of uh, no danger of damage to the excess margin because you are putting the lens upside down on the anterior capsule and but in the posterior chamber it is not an anterior chamber phaco but in the posterior chamber only thing is you are tackling the posterior nuclear plate much faster so you may open up the posterior nuclear plate much easier because the posterior nuclear plate is the most important thing in as far as hard hard cataracts is concerned the demerits is that of the endocapsular technique which have the the entry uh, rexus tear especially when you are doing the direct chop technique and that is why supra capsular phaco with the uh, meloni technique is a better technique for hard bone cataracts this was done long time back i just want to the completion sake Uh, so that uh, people will know about the supra capsular phaco we can do it only thing is very brown very uh, supra hard cataracts very black cataracts is very difficult because very difficult with the nucleus is very big and very difficult to do a lens salute for the nucleus you can grow do it in about grade 3 grade 4 cataracts without any problem so take home messages for this nucleus management soft cataracts as i told you you can do a phaco aspiration or you can do a spring surgery which is actually described by um, uh, paul cock on how to find the spring what is spring surgery sequential pulse removal of the inner nuclear girdle that's why it's called spring surgery and nhd cataracts very tough and especially i call it the vap syndrome in between cataract neither sucks neither crack, neither chops neither holds and this is what i do is just make a very very narrow trench all the way down almost 90% and try to divide the cataract into two halves grade 2 grade 3 cataracts do the divide and conquer technique grade 3 grade 4 you can probably do the stop and chop and grade 5 grade 6 and above i would do the grade the, the direct chop or the vertical chop which i mentioned of the quick chop express which is uh, my my preferred technique uh, because you know this uh, preferred technique used to get used a sharp chopper and make sure that the left hand works much better than the right hand thank you again jay jay for the wonderful opportunity
and thank you again uh, for this fourth uh, uh, series of uh, webinar. Yeah, you are muted. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir, for such a wonderful presentation. I'm, and I'm sure it's uh, 35 years of experience that you have put in these slides. It cannot be, you know, so easy that you are explaining. Uh, definitely, uh, we have uh, learned a lot from these videos. And I'm sure uh, it needs a lot of experience to come up to this level and say we can do direct shop in uh, hard brown. For us, sure, you know, there is a lot of years left to master that. Um, so we will start taking some questions, sir. Um, yes. Sir, I'm, uh, I am a fake. Yeah, we do that. Yeah. Pardon me? I want your opinion, we have anything to add. You have anything to add, I said. Or whatever I said. Sir, I'll, I'll uh, take it up uh, uh, okay. case by case. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, so, myself as a FACO trainer, I am in, say, about 8, 9, 10 years experience of FACO trainer. Uh, most of the students who come here uh, are happy to select NS2 PSC and they are very happy that they have done 15 good cases and they cheer, give cheers and go. But the problem is when they go there, other than NS2 PSC, they are dealing with all other cases. 80% of the cases are not NS2 PSC. So the first case uh, we would like to discuss with you is uh, you know, early NS and uh, NS1. Because I think as you said, you know, the VIP syndrome, basically yeah. they are beautiful to look at in the slit lamp and torch light. Uh, wonderful dilation, uh, but when we take it up, you know, uh, they have a 6966 six, six vision almost, and uh, they have a good near vision also because of the nuclear sclerosis. And the uh, as a beginner, they are very happy to take up such case because it's they feel it's a nice case, yeah. and then the problem starts. So, uh, I, I, I mean, uh, I as a trainer, see the first trench or two trenches they start, you see the glow. Yeah. So, how do you judge the depth in a soft cataract, sir? Anything? <clears throat> See, unless you put the FACO probe, can you just on my video? Raghu? Raghu? Yes, sir, you can, sir. No, no, I'm not able to on my video. Yeah, okay, now. Uh, unless you put the FACO probe, you will not be, whatever the, this street lamp assessment you do pre-operatively, that is all okay to a certain extent. But unless you put the FACO probe and see, you will not know the density of the cataract. Okay. So what I would say is if you make a trench, if, if, the, if the trench goes in very easily, then it's probably a soft cataract. In my opinion, the NS grade one or the grade two, whatever it is, that is more difficult. As beginners, I would suggest that Go for little harder cataracts. The harder cataracts are easier to do than the softer cataracts. All my softer cataracts, because it is dangerous, if you have a problem of a PCR, because these patients come early, they come with 6966 six, six vision, and you have to be very, very careful. So what the soft cataracts, what I'm trying to do is I'm advocating them for the femtocatalyst laser for all these patients. But what I'm trying to say is for, especially for beginners, everybody cannot have, afford to have an femto. But generally, the softer cataracts, don't be complacent. Very important. And always make sure that you don't have excess FACO energy while trenching in softer cataracts. Because you can go all the way down, you can produce a burrow uh, in, in, the, in the posterior capsule. So this has happened to me, this can happen to, uh, it can happen to anybody. What I'm trying to say is, Unless you put the FACO probe and softer cataracts, we have to be very careful because these patients come early to you and you have actually under your using it's more stressful to do softer cataracts than harder cataracts. The harder cataracts because the holdability is there for you. You can hold the cataract, you can chop the cataract, you can play around with the nucleus in the harder cataracts. But a softer cataract, the nucleus control is very, very poor. You should understand this very, very clearly. And that is the reason why I'm trying to say very soft cataracts, if it's grade one, make a slightly larger axis, try to do a hydro dissection, hydro delineation also, and prolapse the nucleus into the iris plane or an anterior chamber 
and then aspirate the nucleus. So that will be easier method of doing it. Or if you're going to do that, the, the, the four quadrant technique can also be done or you can, because it's very difficult to do the chopping techniques for these patients. Have you answered your question? Yes, sir. Sir, I would like to know also, as a beginner, uh, you have certain difficult cases like brown cataract, mature cataract, hypermature, and uh, small pupil, all that. Yeah. Should they prefer to do SICS or should they try FACO initially itself? Or uh, let's say you want to reach them to up to a number where they are proficient and then start. Now, how do, how, what is your uh, this thing? Can you just repeat the question for a minute? <coughs> let's say he's a beginner. Sir. Let's say a surgeon is a beginner. Mm. And uh, he has a few, uh, you know, a little difficult cases on the OT list. Yeah. Let's say mature, slightly brown, not yes. very hard brown. Yes. Uh, what should be the mindset of the surgeons? Should he block the cases so that he should be prepared for anything or he can try? No. If any pre-op counseling that he has to do mandatory? No, no, no. Pre-op counseling, everything can be done as a routine. That's not a problem. But if you have too many cases like that, and uh, uh, what I would suggest is put these cases, tough cases like mature cataracts, small pupils or brown cataracts towards the end of your list. My suggestion for beginners is that block these patients unless the patient has got more than 24, 25 axial length, then you don't have to block it. Do the subtenons, anesthesia and go ahead. Make sure the patient is comfortable and before you do this. <clears throat> small pupils, right in the beginning of the surgery, put iris hooks or malignant ring or BX ring, whatever you are comfortable because a small pupil is one of the most important, what you call enemies as far as the FICO complications is concerned. So you don't want to have small pupil. If you don't see well, you cannot operate well and all the complications will be related to small pupil. So my, my message for beginners is that in the beginning itself, you decide preoperatively, you know exactly what is the density of the cataract to a certain extent and also what is the dilatation of pupil. That is why I make sure that I dilate the patients. Many of the uh, surgeons are not even dilating the patients nowadays to see the density of the cataract. I want to know, for example, I want to know to dilate preoperatively to find out, of course, to see the retina, that's a different issue. But more importantly, I want to know the density of the cataract and I want to know preoperatively how much the pupil is dilating. For me, the most important factor is the more than the density of the cataract, the dilatation of pupil preoperatively. So I need an optimal dilatation of pupil for me to do everything because small pupil is a big problem. So my suggestion is keep it towards the end of the list. Suppose you have 10 cases, keep it at the 8th, 9th and 10th cases and block these patients, make, make sure that you are comfortable, make sure the patients are comfortable, have a plan A, plan B, plan C for all these patients. So. That is the way you, go. you should go. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, there are, I'm not getting any questions from the audience yet. So we will just continue with my own questions. Yes, yes. Um, <coughs> sir, there are two surgeons nowadays, you know, one who get directly trained from ECC, then jump on to FACO. And the other set who are really trained in SICS and then jump to FACO that uh, mostly they are SICS who jump to FACO. You know, when we uh, tackle these kind of, uh, you know, hard cataracts, our first uh, mentality is that, no, we can do a great job in SICS. Why do we want to really struggle in this FACO, you know, so much? So how to get over that, sir? I think it's only a mental block, sir. Mithun. Yeah, mental block, it is there. Okay, if you hard cataracts, if you feel that, uh, if I am able to deliver clear corneas on day one, I'm sure you can deliver, everybody can deliver. Only thing is you need to follow certain protocols in heart cataracts. Okay. Nowadays, we have got fantastic missions and combine the technology with the technique, as I told you, in heart cataracts. Of course, you can do the SICS. It's not a problem at all. But the problem is astigmatism. You can't put for premium IOLs in an SI. You can't have a 6 millimeter, 7 millimeter incision. Obviously, these cataracts we want to do SICs, you can't take it out in 4 millimeter or 5 millimeter. You need about 6-7 millimeter. And in 6-7 millimeter, I don't want to leave it uh, unsutured. Like, so, uh, it's a big problem to have an SICs. My thing is, unless 
the patient is having <clears throat> a very old patient, very sick cornea, almost a black cataract, and you, you saw the video which I'm seeing. Uh, those patients were in the contraindications or a one-night patient, we don't want to take a chance, the black cataract. Those patients, I would suggest that you go in for an SACS and try to do, do the best. But otherwise, routine brown cataracts uh, with a well dilating pupil, my preference would be FICO emulsification because I've been trained in the FICO emulsification. I've hardly done about 40, 50 SACS in my life. I've done uh, more ECCs than, uh, than SACS. But uh, since you have raised this question, I want to tell you, many people think that straight away from uh, you can learn FICO without learning ECC or SACS. That is, I think, not a very good idea. You should know ECC or SACS because the bailing out is very important. When you lose a rexis in a brown cataract, when you try to chop, you to try to cut a rexis or the nucleus is sinking into the vitreous cavity, then you need to convert immediately into ECC or SACS. And you should know how to do an ECC or SACS. And that is the reason why you should know, have an idea of this thing. So all my postgraduates, the first year they do ECC, the second year they do SACS, and the third year they do the FACO. So they know exactly what to do. So they have a good platform, a foundation in ECC and SACS before they come to FACO. So yeah. my, 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 the thing is, it dep depends on whatever you're comfortable with. I cannot, I would not say, no, don't do SACS, you don't only do FACO. I am comfortable with FACO, whatever you are comfortable with seeing. If I'm not comfortable, for example, I had an old patient a couple of days back. She had a really a mature cataract in both eyes, hyper mature cataract in both eyes. She was literally, uh, you know, uh, completely blind. So I thought, okay, uh, then I asked one of my uh, associates to do an SACS for her and she's having fairly okay vision. For them, it's not a very weak issue. But the same patient is literally, literally younger, mature cataract from one eye, then I will definitely go in for a FACO emulsification. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, there's one question from uh, first question, Satin Segal. He has a question. Um, my question about white, Morg I'm quoting him. My question about white Morgognian cataract FACO emulsification after reducing intralenticular pressure after aspirating liquidized cortex remains unanswered. <laughs> So I think he wants to know how to tackle uh, a white Morgagnian cataract. What is your technique? White Morgagnian cataract, you know, is very difficult to do a rexis. The most important thing is as soon as you touch, the most important thing is the rexis, the, rexis, the liquid starts coming out. And the nucleus is a little wobbly <laughs> because the nucleus is much smaller. Though it's a little hard, it's much smaller than the capsular bag itself. So once you uh, 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 remove the liquid cortex from inside, Noisily inflate the bag. This is where I think uh, what you call viscoelastics, OVDs play a very, very important role. You want an OVD like a disco whisk or a helon um, a GV or something like that, which can expand the bag for you so that it can create a space between the anterior and posterior capsule. Then go ahead and do the capsular excess. Then tackling the nucleus in a Morgagnian cataract. In fact, I had a video, I forgot to show that, is a, a little more difficult than the other ones. In the Morgagnian cataract, what I do is I go bevel down, okay, and go to the center of the nucleus, okay? I go to the center of the nucleus and then bury the whole thing, just like a sphere, putting the thing and putting, bury the thing and then chop the cataract from the periphery to the center. That is because these cataracts are a little smaller and you can always see the equator very nicely and you can chop the cataract, everything, and of course, uh, making sure that you have good amount of viscoelastic both in front as well as behind. And when you have a lot of viscoelastic like visco, don't use much of aspiration flow rate. Like if you have very high aspiration flow rate, the visco will get also get aspirated along with the nucleus. So make sure that now and then you fill up the globe with the viscoelastic, fill up the bag with a good viscoelastic, the soft shell technique of Steve Arshinov probably works very well. Hope I have answered this question. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sir, there is one more question from uh, Dr. Hetal Patel. Yeah. Um, she wants to know, uh, sir, your journey from basically lower end machines to higher end machines. Yeah. Have you uh, benefited from higher end machines or were you, uh, have you benefited from Dr. Mohan Rajan? 
<laughs> is the machine important or the surgeon more important? Machine is important. Machine is important. But of course, the uh, when I when I discuss this in the first class, the first know your fake machine. The man behind the machine is more important. The man or the woman, or whatever it is, uh, is more important than the machine. Of course, the higher end machines make your life a little bit easier, especially when you are using this very high. Because it's called FACO technology is something which has come up of very, very very useful, especially when you are using dealing with brown cataracts. And that is why I'm confidently telling that it will deliver clear corneas irrespective of density of cataract because of the cold FACO. In the lower men, machines, you don't have the cold FACO. You can have the regular pulse. The regular pulse goes only up to 8 to 10 pulses per second. In cold FACO, you can go a hyper pulse. You can go up to 120, 200, 240. The advantage is that if you go higher pulse, the on-off time can also be reduced to a large extent. So the amount of FACO energy, which is I showed that animation on the hyperpulse or how it works. The hyperpulse was actually uh, demonstrated or brought in by the White Star, which is the, uh, which is uh, originally the AMO product, the White Star software. And this is the basis of all the hyperpulse of the micropulse, which all the <coughs> machines have got. Now the low, there's no question of having a lower end machine now. Or going for a higher end machine. Now all the basic machines are coming out with the micro pulse technology. So yeah, even machines like Apasom machines have got turbo with fantastic machines and the robo machines are all having micro pulse. Everybody is having micro pulse or hyper pulse or whatever it is and makes life easy. If you're going for a routine cataracts, grade two, grade three, it doesn't make a, whichever uh, uh, FICO machine you're using. But for small pupils, or the, when you're using, when, you, when a patient is having an IFIS syndrome or something like that, you know, your iris is floppy, then you need to have better fluidics, so better sensors, so better chamber stability and uh, subluxated cataracts and all these brown cataracts. All these, if you want to deliver consistently good results on this day one post-op, which is very, very important, uh, I think higher missions are uh, uh, definitely player. Yeah, key role. I'm a, don't go for the highest possible mission. The, all missions are very good nowadays. When we started, when I started in 93, 94, 93 when I started the FICO Mills occasion, at that time I was operating in, because I didn't have Rajan Aikar at that time, I was operating in another private nursing home and I used to have my, uh, uh, the, the Apasami guys. I was the first one to get the Apasami machine, peristaltic system. Until recently, I had that machine with me because those guys wanted that as an archive. So I just gave it to them. And uh, uh, this is a mission I used to do the FACO multiplication. The guy, because none of the guys, the engineers also didn't know about the FACO machine. We also didn't know anything about the FACO machine. At that time, there were no CDs, no videos, no textbooks, nothing was there available at that time. So. We just learned by themselves. By thing, I used to take about two hours for each FICO uh, emulsification at that time. So <clears throat> that scenario is not there now because so many things are available, opportunities are available, technology is available at the touch of a button. Everything is available, and technique is also available. Newer techniques have evolved. So many techniques have come out. So it's no point in talking about older machines, older FICO machines, because Kelman, you know how it started. He had a fixed power and he had white corneas, almost every case, whatever he did, because he did anterior chamber FACO at that time. So it doesn't mean that you are using. The concept is the same. Only thing is newer FACO machines. It's just like any other technology, just like the cell phone technology. You will not use such bulky Nokia phones or the, we used to have the bigger phones at that time. And nowadays we got sleek phones with better software in the phones, similar to that. So I think there's no point. You should have a combination of technology and technique. The technique is what you are learning and what you are learning, what you are, you are trained in. So having only the technology without technique and having only the technique without the technology also, I think it's, it's, a, it's like a husband and wife. It's like a marriage. It's an alliance which has to be there forever. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to apologize to all because I will not be able to take all the questions. I will try to take as many as possible. So let us go to the next question uh, from Dr. Sudhir Yadav. He says, how important is rotating nucleus? Should all nucleus be rotated? What is the problem in rotating nucleus at all? 
I think only PPC your meaning should be rotate, should we do hydro? I think uh, sir will answer that. Absolutely. Sir, how do we tackle uh, PPC? In a... Do not attempt to rotate the nucleus in a posterior polar cataract. Okay. But all other cataracts, I believe you should try and rotate the nucleus. Okay. I don't rotate the nucleus. I don't see whether my nucleus rotates. But I know it will rotate by experience. So that is what, see, when you know that your hydro dissection is go, two or three quadrants, your hydro dissection is going through and the nucleus comes forward, the entry chamber becomes a little shallow, then it means the nucleus rotates. If you try and rotate the nucleus, the nucleus will definitely rotate. Why it is important to, do, to rotate the nucleus? Because when you are doing the stopping, the chopping technique, especially the direct chopping technique in brown cataracts and all that, because if we don't rotate the nucleus and you try to chop the nucleus, then the stress and the forces, uh, they can go all the way to the periphery, to the zonules as well. Okay. If you try to, if the nucleus is nicely rotatable in the, in the bag, then the, whatever force you are giving, the force will <coughs> stop with the boundaries of the nucleus only. It will not go to the capsular bag. So that is why I think it, nuclear rotation is very, very important. So you don't have to mechanically every time rotate and see. You know exactly this nucleus will rotate, this nucleus will not rotate. What I would suggest is do a trench and try to rotate the nucleus. If the nucleus does not rotate with a minimal force, then come back, fill up the globe with viscoelastic and then go do a hydro dissection again and try to rotate the nucleus. If you do a forceful, try to forcefully try to rotate the nucleus and that is the time you can rupture the PC can have a nucleus going into the vitreous cavity, you can rupture the zonules, you can do whatever, all damage can occur. I think nucleus rotation is very, very important. I discussed this in the last uh, week uh, webinar as well. Sir, we have two types of chops, uh, like vertical and horizontal. Uh, I am more comfortable horizontal because I have started it that way. Yes. Should we have, uh, you know, different chopping techniques for different uh, cataracts or if we are comfortable in horizontal, even in the most brown, we should go ahead. Yes, sir. The horizontal chopping, if you are comfortable with horizontal chopping, only thing is don't use a sharp chopper in horizontal chopping. Use a blunt chopper, use a sh maybe a shorter, not a longer one, because you can go. See, the horizontal chopping is, a, as I told you, the problem is it's a little blind technique because you are going underneath the capsular axis and coming all the way from the equator. Okay, as long as it's grade <coughs> two, grade three, and sometimes even in grade four, it works very well because the cortical cushion is well. Beyond that, what happens is, as I told you, the nucleus is there. It's nucleus and more nucleus. Okay. And then after that, it's only the capsular bag. The entire bag is filled with the nucleus. And these cases, the vertical chop in my hands work better. The simple reason is that horizontal chop is very difficult to do. Of course, you have to uh, go underneath the axis come from the periphery, you can do that if you have got experience. But in my hands, the vertical chop works definitely better. Only thing is a vertical chop, you have to go vertically down like this. That is, normally in a, when you are doing a trenching, there are this, suppose this is the rexus margin and you are going parallel to the rexus margin. Whereas in vertical chop, you have to go a little down, as if you are going into the anterior vitreous. Going vertically down, so I do bevel down, because I want the occlusion faster, you can do bevel up, bevel sideways, bevel down, whatever you are comfortable with. Only thing is keep the chopper right in the front and vertical chopping because everything happens under your direct vision, right in front of the excess margin, especially in the sink. And you know exactly where your, whether your posterior nuclear plate is opening up very nicely in a vertical chopping. So if you are comfortable with horizontal chopping, well and good, no problem. Only thing is, the chopper has to be different and your rexis and your technique has to be slightly different because you have to uh, turn the chopper, go underneath and turn it again. Come, come. Okay. Turn the chopper horizontally, go underneath and there's a possibility of damaging the rexis margin if you're not very, very sure. Especially when the pupil comes down on you in IFIS syndrome, then the, word, the horizontal chopping becomes a little more difficult. Yes, Vertical yes. chopping because you are right in the front of the rexus margin. Yes. Even if the pupil is small, you can do the vertical chopping. Yes, sir. I get your point. <laughs> I'll try to change to yes. Yes. <laughs> vertical chopping. Sir, they want you to repeat what is spring technique, sir. Even I want you to repeat. I mean, I have not heard of this. Spring technique is very, very simple. 
it is called sequential pulsed removal of the inner nuclear girdle that's called it's called spring technique which has been described by paul cock and howard fine okay and uh, <clears throat> the spring surgery is a, for very soft cataracts what you do is you just make a shallow trench okay using a very low fico power these are all very soft cataracts and uh, low vacuum and uh, low aspiration flow rate then once you make a shallow trench we saw you saw it in the video there then you make a 6 o'clock slight nucleotomy okay something like a, you just go to the periphery and make a slight nucleotomy 6 o'clock and then you rotate that cataract before that you need to do make sure that you have a good hydro delineation hydro hydro dissection at least or if you want you can do hydro delineation also these are anyway soft cataracts it doesn't make a difference and <coughs> then you have to rotate and do an opposite uh, uh, the this thing also in a nucleotomy and once you do that then what happens is the inner nuclear girdle uh, suppose you increase the vacuum and aspiration flow rate starts folding up on you that is called sequential pulse you can use a hyper pulse or the regular pulse and when they started the spring technique long time back 20 years or 25 years back in 90 95 96 when paul cock described it at that time the regular pulse only was available but nowadays we have got the hyper pulse and the micro pulse which makes life very very easy for the spring technique oh, thank you sir <laughs> but this uh, is done only with very soft cataracts okay a little more harder cataracts or in between cataracts you are in trouble in spring course mm. because very difficult to do that uh, dr navnur singh says uh, sir what are your preferred techniques to prevent argentinian flag sign i would like to add let's say we have an argentinian flag sign can we convert to can opener and do fake will we face oh, any no. difficulties uh, you, uh, you should not convert that into a can opener but i would says that if you have an argentina flag sign i have showed this uh, video uh, last uh, week in the capsular access um, uh, webinar so if you have argentina flag sign what i would suggest is you convert because you are two pillars now okay two pillars extending from one end to the other you convert one end one pillar or one half into a semicircular capsular access then other half to the semicircular capsular access depending on the density of the cataract i am underlining this important line depending on the density of the cataract if the cataract is grade 2 grade 3 then you can go in for a direct chop technique and try or try to bring the nucleus up into the iris plane so that you don't have any stress on the bag and go ahead with the fake emulsification if it's a real brown cataract then you can i still go ahead with the thing but only thing is as a message for all the people here that is why i think you have to keep the ego in the back of your mind and also don't allow your ego to come here in front and convert into ecc or sics which a brown cat right because it is very dangerous especially the the tear which is uh, on the at the 6 o'clock that is the opposite meridian can go rapidly across the equator into the posterior capsule and can lose the lens into the vitreous cavity and it's going to be a very brown cat right removing the nucleus from the vitreous cavity is also going to be a real problematic and of course you had you can use trachodrome but it's going to be a real problem for the posterior segment surgeon as well so i think argentina flag sign prevention okay that's what they wanted there's a different ways we can prevent the argentina flag sign what i do is <clears throat> nowadays i'm doing the femtorexis patients you cannot afford i do the panchorexis or you can put a 26 or 27 gauge needle into the anterior Uh, uh, the compartment and try to aspirate the nucleus and uh, uh, what do you call decompress the front compartment and go ahead always make sure that you have a soft shell <laughs> technique using viscoat and helon and making sure that you have good uh, seeing hypotony i always give pre operative mannitol for these patients in intermittent cataract these are the type 1 cataracts which are very dangerous white cataracts as you know is a type 1 type 2 and type 3 type 1 is the one which has got very high interlenticular pressure and these are cataracts i always put a super pinky i give a block for these patients super pinky for about 5 minutes and make sure there is good hypotony good viscoelastics trypan blue stain very important 
can have the T sign, which is on my surgical strike uh, the website also, which is uh, the, the, the T shaped reverse rexis, uh, which has been uh, advocated by Kamal Kapoor of Delhi. Or you can use the YAG laser also. The YAG laser preoperatively, you can try to drain the uh, what you call the anterior, you can press the anterior compartment. In all these techniques, the problem is the anterior compartment is taken care. Still, you have a possibility because there's a posterior pressure which is there. In punctorexis, only thing is you need to go with a bevel down needle, zero degree or a 15 degree is what I use normally. Use just simple HPMC, don't use viscoat or real on, then go bevel down <coughs> straight as if as you are going into the anterior vitreous, vertically down and give a burst of phaco. And, and uh, the, the FACO not only uh, the, uh, it punches the anterior capsule, the FACO energy also depulses the nucleus, pushes the nucleus. Please understand in Argentina flag sign, the <clears throat> intermesin cataracts, there are four components. One is the pressure underneath the anterior capsule. The nucleus is bulky. There is a pressure in front of the posterior capsule. And there is also a positive vitreous pressure. So the puncture axis takes care of all these or if you've got access to the femtorexis, takes care of all these components which are there. Of course, other methods can also be done, like the uh, uh, aspiration with the needle and going to the periphery. Some of them have done that also. Or making what is called a smaller rexis and making a, what is called double rexis, making a smaller rexis, aspirating the, uh, the, the cortex, liquid cortex, uh, decompressing the front compartment and then going. So, different methods are there. Sir, is the uh, femtor excess 100% uh, uh, success in 100 percent 100% success. Only thing is you need to have a slightly different offset <coughs> uh, parameters for femtor excess. I use a little more energy and I keep an offset of about 600 millimeters. Sometimes what happens is, only thing is in femtor excess in a white cataract, please understand it may not be free floating like the regular immature cataracts, okay? So always skip areas will be there. So don't try to pull the, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, just like a free floating, don't try to just pull the rexis out, and then you can have a tear in the rexis margin. More importantly, so once you uh, do a femtorexis, fill up the globe with the viscoelastic, and then look for the skip areas. The skip areas will be there, but most of the cases, whatever you have done, for the past uh, two and a half years now with the, with the catalyst, with all the white cataracts, the femtorexis works 100% of the time. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, next question is, uh, shallow AC, any tips for uh, in the back FACO? Doctor, by Dr. Vamsi from I Foundation, my two palin. Yeah. <clears throat> shallow, uh, shallow AC, uh, uh, if you have a high hypero, for example, the chamber depth is not there, always increase the bottle height, okay? And then, now and then, inject the viscoelastic into the anterior chamber, fill up the globe with the viscoelastic and push the posterior capsule back. And the uh, in the back FACO is a must for, uh, especially in the shallow AC, because we are very close to the corneal endothelium. The anterior chamber is going to be uh, uh, very shallow, uh, uh, very less also. And uh, you can have a problem of uh, 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 corneal edema in the post-operative period where the lens, uh, the nucleus uh, is in. The parameters I would suggest is that uh, if you have a shallow AC preoperatively, you know, uh, have a good hypotony for these patients so that the vitreous pressure also is taken care of. Uh, you can give intraoperative uh, um, mannitol bolus 50 ml also to reduce the uh, thing. Now and then, give good viscoelastic. Maybe, see, you need a viscoelastic like Helon GV or Helon, um, Helon 5 is not available nowadays or just plain Helon is also uh, very good. So which actually uh, uh, fills up the, the space in the anterior chamber, fills up the bag so that the posterior capsule is uh, 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 back and you can go ahead. Making sure that your parameters are very, very less. Do a slow motion FACO. Okay, don't be very racing. Do, do a slow motion FACO. Make sure that your uh, pieces of the nucleus, especially when you are dealing with a brown cataract, make sure that your pieces, nucleus pieces, become very, very smaller and smaller. Then easier to aspirate in the bag. 
if you have a large boulder, it's very difficult. The whole nucleus will start coming into the anterior chamber and you will have a white cornea. So these are the parameters I would say, protocols I would say, if you have a shallow yes. Thank you. So next question is, uh, what precautions to take in hazy cornea with a hard cataract? My question is, if you see a hazy cornea and a very hard cataract, would you like to continue phacosar or uh, SIC is preferable? If you are good at it, of course, as you said. The hazy cornea means preoperatively or intraoperatively, I'm asking. I think preoperatively. Preoperatively, you have a sick cornea and a hard cataract. If you are confident of doing an SACS, please go ahead with the, with the SACS. Or even the ECC, I would not hesitate. Nowadays, we have, I have the, because I have access to catalysts, I have patients with cornea cateta with a brown cataract, then I go ahead with the catalyst. But my suggestion is, if you have a sick cornea and a very hard cataract, please do ECC or SACS, whatever you are comfortable, but not FACO. Sir, uh, they are asking about what is the use of burst mode? Burst mode. The burst mode actually is a, is a good mode for you, if, for example, when you want to hold the nucleus or when you want to sometimes do the trenching, the burst mode can also be used. But nowadays, nobody is using the burst mode. I'm not using, for example, and some of the machines don't even have the burst mode now. So the burst mode is actually when you want to hold the nucleus. The burst mode comes, for example, 600 milliseconds, the FACO will be on when you press the foot switch and it will be off after that. So burst mode is, uh, for example, when you want to hold the nucleus, so you just go press the foot switch, the burst mode will be there, you can hold the nucleus and then you can chop. So that way, or if you want to do a trenching, Trenching, I always use, prefer a continuous uh, FACO. Even for chopping, I also, uh, I prefer a continuous, or you can go for a burst mode FACO. When you want to do puncture excess, you can do burst mode actually. It works wonderfully well in burst mode because when you go punch all the way down, the punch, uh, the, the burst mode uh, opens up, that is, punches the anterior capsule and also, as I told you, uh, uh, emulsifies a part of the, uh, the nucleus also. Thank you, sir. Next question is, uh, even I want to ask this question, sir. When we take up high myopathies, nowadays I'm facing, uh, you know, difficulties after 40s, you know, that cornea is getting focused separately and the PC is getting focused separately. How is your experience 10 years or 15 years ahead? Is it going to get worse or is it going to remain the same, sir? And what are your tips to really, you know, focus all the things at a time? Or no, can no. we... I think uh, you don't have to worry about the cornea, different uh, foci. Only thing is anterior chamber is uh, going to be very deep. Make sure that your bottle light is very less and uh, in high myopia, don't keep the bottle light busy. And also please understand in high myopia, there can be a fluid misdirection syndrome. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And you can go, the, 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 the fluid can go underneath the iris and start, the iris can start coming forward. And this is a very common uh, situation. My myopia can go through zonules. Sometimes it can increase and even push the posterior capsule forward. So this is uh, something which is you have to keep in mind. And uh, wherever you are doing, that is, for example, when you are doing the nucleus emulsification, you focus on the anterior and the posterior capsule. When you are doing the cortical aspiration, you focus on the posterior capsule. Okay. When you are doing the capsular excess, you focus on the anterior capsule. And when you're uh, doing the hydro procedure, you can focus on the anterior capsule or on the cornea, it doesn't matter. Okay. So wherever you are, it doesn't matter uh, you have, uh, whether all the things have to be in focus at all. You know, high myopia, it may be a little difficult, especially when you have an ectatic cornea, it's going to be even worse. Sometimes reflexes can come. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, any particular uh, step where you, you have to do bevel down tip FACO? I do all bevel down. Okay. Yeah, I do all bevel down, especially for harder cataracts. Any particular uh, sense means uh, I don't understand what it means. Uh, even I didn't understand. Yeah, I bevel down. I do the fico for the fico chop. I do the bevel down. If you notice my videos, all my design is fico bevel down. The advantage of bevel down is that because you are going bevel down, the your fico energy is also directed like that. Okay, number one. Number two is. Because you're going bevel down, instead of bevel up, okay, it's very difficult to get the occlusion of the nucleus piece, okay? Like the bevel up, it takes a longer time. So you can do that, it takes a longer time. 
Whereas the bevel down, the occlusion occurs very fast. And you want the faster occlusion because you want to chop these cataracts very fast also. So that is the idea. In the Quick Chop Express, that is the idea. Wherein you keep the chopper there and go bevel down and you create a vacuum seal as, a, as fast as possible. And uh, that is where you do. But the bevel down is only a personal preference. It doesn't mean that everybody has to do it. Bevel down. I don't find any uh, this thing. And if you feel that bevel up, sometimes because it's a little dangerous, you feel as if it's dangerous, as if you're going bevel down, sometimes you can go into the uh, posterior capsule. It doesn't matter at all because these cataracts, as I told you, are very thick cataracts, very thick cataracts and occupies a lot of space in the capsular bag. And if you see it on the femto, uh, this thing, it will be so thick <coughs> and about five, six, five millimeter to six millimeter thickness. So that is the problem with these cataracts. And uh, you can go bevel down and actually expose the tip very nicely and go all the way into the substance of the, into the body of the nucleus before you chop. If you go anteriorly, you can touch the anterior capsule. If you go posteriorly, you touch the posterior capsule, damage the posterior capsule. So you need to actually go into the middle of the nucleus. If you notice all these videos, I go into the middle of the nucleus and go bevel down and vertically down. Not horizontally, not yes. tangential, not horizontally, vertically down. You have to tilt like this. Little scary in the beginning because as if you are going into the anterior vitreous, it will be like that. But these are all very big cataracts. That's why same somebody was asking me whether this sharp chopper can damage the posterior capsule. It will never damage the posterior capsule because these cataracts are very, very hard, very, very thick as well. And this chopper is only 1.75 millimeter. These cataracts are minimum of about 5 millimeter size. Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. I think that's uh, that's the question. Your uh, final take-home message for uh, present youngsters, sir. Uh, what I feel is youngsters are more uh, on to FACO and other basics are just uh, being lost, you know. So you're just a uh, message from your journey of life, you know, from being anterior, posterior, a master of everything. <laughs> take-home message, sir. Uh, the message is that I think... Uh, uh, whatever you are learn, uh, learning, you learn with uh, with the passion and uh, uh, and uh, take a lot of effort in becoming better and better. Okay, every day it's a learning. Uh, ophthalmology or medical science, for that matter, is a learning process every day. Every day I learn. In fact, I learn from the webinar. You people learn from me, but I also learn from all of you guys. So it's a learning process. It has to be a two-way process. That fire in the belly has to be there, and uh, the fire and the and the passion and the commitment and the determination and the perseverance and uh, of course the effort. If you don't take effort, even God cannot help you. If you take effort, God will make sure that you reach the pinnacle of success. Effort and hard work. There's no substitute for hard work. My four mantras. I would say and stop this. That is called consistent, well directed self-motivated effort. So consistent, well-directed, self-motivated effort. You have to be motivated. Unless you have motivation to do better and better that in life, not only in life, in profession, in whatever you are learning, and not be happy with whatever you have learned today. Because something there, which is that. Because in this COVID time, everybody thought, everything. We, we learned so many things in this COVID time. It's a challenging time for everybody, but we learned so many things. And that is what it's like. So. This self-motivation has to be there. The motivation has to come from within. That, or you get motivated by seeing others, uh, role models, you have role models, but you have to have the same self-motivated and effort. That is, nobody can touch you. That I'm sure everybody can reach the pinnacle of success. That is my message to all of you. But don't be, don't be depressed by your failures. Don't be depressed by your failures. And don't be, what you call, elated by your success also. That is my thinking. Have a level head and have a cool and calm head. Because failures can come, same time success can also come. But don't allow your success to go into your head. Same time, don't be depressed by failures also. If you have a nucleus drop, I had my nucleus drop after 4,000 cases. After 4,000 cases of my FACO, I got depressed. But subsequently, I said, no, no, I don't think it's a very major issue. I did a vitrectomy and did the same patient did very well. That's a different issue. But I'm talking about in 93, 94 at that time uh, when I had a nucleus drop. 
95, I think so. It was the first, the first case of nuclear stop I had. But if somebody, you know, I find that many of my FACO trainees, some of them, when they have a nuclear drop, then they immediately start abandoning FACO and uh, stop doing FACOs and all. I think that is not a good thing. Because you have to learn. The learning process, everybody, you should find out, go back and see your videos and find out where you have gone wrong, why it has occurred, so that you don't repeat your mistake. So I record all my cases. That is what I say, I tell everybody. Record my, all my cases. And every day in the evening, I find out and tell my guy which are the cases which have got complications, take those videos. And that is why, you know, all these ophthalmic pre-made leagues, I was able to win because I recorded all my cases. Thank that you, is, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us today. It's been a privilege and honor to moderate you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mithun. You've thank been you. really fantastic. Really fantastic. All the best. Thank you. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, J&J, for the wonderful opportunity. Raghu. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Richard. Thank, thank you, you thank all. You all. Oh, Dashinder sir. is there? No. He's there. He's there. Muted. there. See you guys. Okay. See you again next week. Dashinder, thanks a lot. Thanks to you. Thank, thank you, Dashinder. Thank you, uh, Raghu. Hmm? Okay, Dr. Mitchell. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. Take yeah. care.